So, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, let, me, let me say this first before we jump in. Uh, spent a lot of time this week praying and preparing. I, I don't want to over-embellish this at all. Uh, but this message today is going to be a little different than usual. Um, I don't want to say that in preparing for this message, it was difficult, because if it was difficult, that means, God, I don't want to do this. Uh, is there a way that we can kind of just fast forward to chapter 8? You know, so I wouldn't say that it was difficult. It was definitely challenging in terms of preparing for this morning's message, because uh, this message prep, like I said, uh, has been different than any other message that I've done before. And so challenging because, Holy Spirit, what is it that you want to communicate through me? And so uh, I'll say even now, that's still the prayer. I will say that today's uh, message, there will be parts where it will be for mature audiences only. And so I want to specifically address those who are online. Uh, keep that in mind as well. Hi. <laughs> hey, uh, coming in just two months-ish, Karen and I are going to be celebrating 29 years of marriage. Look at that. Look at, look at the babies. 20, look at the hair. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out, Brian. I appreciate that. I did have hair. Yes, there's the evidence. The proof is in the pudding. Uh, 22 years young in that picture. Uh, mind you, Kara was one day or continues to be one day older than me. So, uh, uh, 29 years in May. I, I, I would say that our marriage uh, has, like every marriage, uh, has experienced its highs and lows. I would honestly testify before you today to say that there, were, there have been more highs than lows. We've had our rough, rough paths, patches. We've had our, um, what I would say, our road uh, under construction. Uh, you know, speed bumps, detours, all the things. Some of you have heard my testimony in walking into Living Water Church came at a time when Karen and I were discussing some things that we never thought we would ever communicate, and that was how are we going to end our marriage now. But so grateful that uh, God is faithful and am grateful that uh, he never gives up on us. And so I'm grateful to my wife, Kara, love you. 29 years in two months. That's crazy. Um, so with that said, we are continuing our series called God's Building God's Masterpieces as we do a deep dive in this book or this letter, 1 Corinthians. God is in the business of changing us into the image of his son, which means that we are under construction daily, all the time, uh, that he wants to take our mess and turn it into a message, and uh, so he's not done with us. Hey, would you do me a favor? I've done this before, and I think it would be appropriate to do it here. Uh, I want to enter into an art gallery, and so I'm going to just show you an image, and I just want you to explain what comes to your mind. Say it out loud. What comes to your mind when you see this image? Talk to me. You see a heart? Okay. Say again, Andy. How big Jesus is? Okay. A small child. What else stands out to you as you see this? It's enough. That's good. It's simple. He's, he's given the heart. He's got the heart there. Okay. Say again. Commitment. Surrender. Good. Jesus sees the child. That's good. It's a connection. Trust. 
say again, giving everything. I think it's a good segue right there to continue today's, uh, this, this message as we sort of get prepared to take off from the airstrip this morning. I want to make this point, uh, and that is, this is like today's main idea, and it's this. Biblical marriage is the closest example of a relationship with Christ. Biblical marriage is the closest example of a relationship with Christ. Now, here's the thing. If this is true, and it is, don't you think that one of Satan's main targets would be a marriage that seeks to put Christ at the center of it? Also, don't you think that the evil one would aggressively, relentlessly go after the institution of biblical marriage to cause opposition and confusion since the living God is the very one who established it? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle with one another. We don't fight physically with one another. But our true fight, our true battle, our true war is with evil spirits, dark and evil principalities, and yes, even wicked authorities in the spiritual unseen realm. In, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says that a Christian marriage is a great mystery, but not too mysterious. Marriage is a spiritual picture and testimony of Christ's relationship to the church. And it's interesting that when we read our Bible, whether you do that on the U version through an application or your physical Bible, uh, at the top specifically of uh, the top section of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 are these words, instruction on marriage. Now, subject lines in our Bible can be confusing when opening and reading his word. Now, there are three primary things to take into, uh, into serious consideration when you read and open scripture. You can write these things down. However you want to do that. These are the three primary things to take into consideration, serious consideration, when you read and open Scripture. Here's the first thing. The first is context. Say context. Now, the second sounds pretty similar, uh, kind of close to it. The second is context. Say context. And the third is context. Now, here's the thing. The Bible has principles to live by. Why? Because it is the best guide for life. And asking what applies to you is healthy, but we must keep in mind context, context, context. I think we forget that the Bible is actually a story of recorded history with real people and real life situations. This is, in fact, Context. Now, here's the thing, because there's some schools of thought that say, now wait a minute, Rob. Wait a minute. It's not context. Some would say that uh, you're, you, you know, you could be watering down the truth and impact of the word if all your focus is in is context. But I want to suggest to you, I want you to consider what the integrity of Scripture is. Bad theology comes when a person or persons takes one verse completely out of context. It is called cherry picking. And then builds out by finding other verses that look and sound similar to support a theological claim and then call it theology. They'll even write books about it. Listen, cults and weird religions are started by this kind of practice. See, if you're not doing it this way, then you're not committed. 1 Corinthians is not a theological dissertation. It is not a thesis, and it's not a claimed conclusion. What we read and see happening is literally discipleship in action. It's called applied theology. 
say, applied theology. There is a difference between God's instruction, his commands, and particularly here in chapter 7, there's a difference between God's instruction and Paul's opinion. And here in chapter 7, Paul is providing his counsel and advice. Although Paul believes his opinions are supported by the Holy Spirit, it seems that he's humble enough to maintain an attitude of, this is what I think and believe is best for you. Now in context, what Paul thinks is best comes from a single, non-married perspective. I wish you were all single like me, Paul says. We need to also recognize that Paul is coming from a strict Jewish background. And on top of all of this, we are getting only half the story. Because Paul has already written them a letter. And then The thing of it is, is we don't have that letter. And then the church has written him back. Guess what? We don't have that letter. 1 Corinthians is Paul's response to their letter. And I want you to, as we, again, getting ready to take off here, the main point in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is this. Marriage and singleness are gifts given by God. The title of my message this morning is, is marriage and singleness in a sexualized culture. I think we need to pray. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you, God, that your word does not mince any words, anything that you want to communicate to us. So, Father, I pray from the depths of my heart that you would get me out of the way and that your words from your truth, would speak right to our hearts this morning. I pray that whatever uh, theological baggage that we may have, that we may carry, help us to maintain a spirit of humility. I pray that you would be honored and glorified in this as we open your word. And it's for your glory we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Marriage and singleness in a sexualized culture. I want to add a byline byline to this uh, sermon title, and it's this, the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter. To repeat, we will draw unbiblical conclusions if we do not take into, uh, into serious consideration what the culture specifically was like in Corinth. And so we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and then often we'll refer to it when people ask and or are struggling with marriage and singleness. And what happens is, if we're not careful, we'll make irrational and irresponsible statements like this. See, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 8, if you're a widow, stay single. Yet in the book of Timothy, Paul says the very opposite, that widows should remarry. And then people say, see, this is why you can't trust the Bible, because there are obvious contradictions. The bottom line is this, is that life and culture in Ephesus, which is where we read the book of Timothy, was very different than life and culture in Corinth. And this is why context is so crucial. Now, this is the part that I want to specifically say. Now, we're 30,000 foot. Uh, feet in the air, our, tray tra- our tray tables are out now, and we're getting uh, beverages, not food, but beverages, and we're kind of settled in, okay? This part here is, I'll just say, for mature audiences. Pornea, where we get the word pornography, is a Greek word that essentially means illicit sexual activity. The original meaning of porneia is to prostitute or to sell. However, by the time of the New Testament, porneia had a very broad meaning that included sexual behavior such as prostitution 
extramarital sexual intercourse or adultery, pedophilia, promiscuity, homosexuality and lesbianism, incest, premarital sex, and bestiality, which is sex with animals. At the center of Corinth, you guys doing okay? <laughs> At the center of Corinth, 1,800 feet from the water's edge, and it took two hours to walk uphill, was the focal point of Corinthian Greek culture, including philosophy, religion, entertainment, family and everyday life, even sports, and a temporary sense of financial prosperity and protection. I say temporary because uh, Corinth was really known as a, like um, a, a lot of, like the, the lights never turned out like, like um, Las Vegas. Lots of commerce, lots of money flowing from the city of Corinth. But it was temporary, of course. Now, what was there? What was, what was at the focal point 1,800 feet from the water's edge? What was there was the temple of Aphrodite. Now, Aphrodite is, not was, but is the demonic goddess of beauty and sex. Although the physical temple had been several decades removed since the time of Paul, its religious and philosophical influence had permeated and settled into the life and culture of Corinth. And biblical scholars do say that the temple of Aphrodite was rebuilt during the time of 1 Corinthians. The practices of the temple of Aphrodite are simply too graphic to explain. Do your own research. But the temple consisted of over a thousand female and male prostitutes, young and old, who were used to recruit and lure followers into gruesome occult practices that stirred and invited demonic entities into sexual acts. In fact, the term out-of-body experiences out of and from this era of time. Now, the attitude of the city toward immorality involved no condemnation, rather. It was considered to be a normal part of life. And the same loose attitude was often reflected in the church. The case of incest, we looked at this last, uh, last week in chapter 6, and the question about the Christian view of marriage, that's today's message in chapter 7, had their roots in the immoral mind of the city of Corinth. And most of the members of the church were Gentiles, non-Jews, and the strict morality characteristic of the Jews was completely foreign to them. They found it difficult to understand that what they once considered virtue was now sin. And so with that, we're going to read the first uh, few verses of this chapter, chapter 7. Just going to read 1 to 7, and we're going to do a book end, and then bring it home by reading just a couple more verses towards the end of this chapter. Okay, so here we go. And Paul is writing here, when now... Regarding the question you asked in your letter, yes, it's good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The, uh, the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Verse 5, and we're going to revisit this later. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 
So I say this as a concession, not as a command. But I wish everyone were single just as I am, yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. That's one side of the, of the book end. Here's the other one. We're going to jump down to th- verse 32 and read a couple verses here. Paul writes, I, wanna, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him, God. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided in the same way a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. Now, here's the thing. I want to encourage you, every time we come together in this setting and we share God's word, uh, my encouragement to you is that you would go home and that you would sort of read the whole thing. Uh, I encourage you. Yes, to do that even this week, to read the whole chapter here of chapter 7. Because I'm going to be taking a summarizing approach today, so I encourage you, again, exhort you to read the rest of this chapter sometime today, but definitely this week. Now, we have to understand the background here in chapter 7, which was a Greek culture filled with Greek mythology and philosophies, evil religious practices which normalize sexual immorality that through any kind of reason, let alone biblical logic, out the window. We just read and got a glimpse of the confusion going on in the church right as we get right into this chapter 7 where the church inquires, should Christian couples have sex in their marriage? There's confusion. Now, the push for sexual immorality, porneia, in a culture, listen, is nothing new under the sun. Cultural ideas and demonic philosophies only just recycle, but with different names, but same gods, evil gods, and also verbiage. Now, I don't think I have to try and convince you that today we are living in a highly, highly sexual, immoral society with a clear demonic agenda that doesn't seem to be slowing down. Here are some images to show you just what I mean. I don't need to put commentary. Go ahead to the next one. I don't know what this does to your heart. Uh, I am in no way wanting to put a stumbling block between you and God. But, but let me say this. My heart grieves in what's happening in our culture right now. Uh, these pictures, these images... Our current, 2024, and hopefully, just as Jesus looks over from the hill with tears over Jerusalem, and yes, John 11.35 says Jesus wept, what was he crying about? He was saying, people are going to reject me. People are going to turn from me. My own people will turn away from the truth, I'm broken. And so I've been praying that this message and even these images that we're displaying today will break your heart for souls. And now, I hope at the very same time it leads you to a righteous indignation 
that we don't wrestle and fight against flesh and blood. That our fight is spiritual. And the enemy, yes, is active, just like he was in the days of Corinth. When this tactical, satanic plan infiltrates the church, overtaking the God-ordained family unit of moms, dads, and children, listen, a society, a culture is destined to collapse. I want us to look at how the gift of purity and how the gift of Specifically, and purity of marriage and singleness, God's way, was under attack in Corinth, and yes, continues to be under attack today. And how we are called to stand our ground in the name of Jesus Christ. And so my points are reflections that played out in Corinth, and yes, still plays out today. Let me tell you, that kids are not safer in a, at a sexualized show than at church. That's a lie. Here's my first point. And I want you to go ahead and blurt it out because we just need to kind of release, um, possibly, some physical tension, maybe even spiritual tension. So I want you to just yell it out. I want you to yell out, YOLO! YOLO. Now, what does that mean? You only live once. YOLO. Now, well, YOLO, so go get yours before somebody gets it first. It would not be far-fetched to replace the popular phrase to live immorally like a Corinthian with to live immorally like a Californian. To live immorally like a Corinthian was a cultural phrase of endearment that meant live it up as sexually as you can. Everything goes. Everyone else is doing it. Why not you? YOLO, you only live once. We are mature audience and adults in here. The obvious topic that Paul is addressing in chapter 7 was and is sex. This was the main concern of the believers in Corinth. Now think about it. Think about this. Corinthian society had no rules whatsoever in the area of sex. So whether married, single, virgin, widowed, divorced, or separated, YOLO, you only live once. So go get it. Every advice that Paul gives here has sex as the backdrop. His rebuttal to a YOLO mindset and heart set is this. Women and men are not sexual objects to be used and abused. Humanity, human beings are to be treated as valuable and loved by God. That is the truth. Now, we got back from Africa just a couple weeks ago. Is it a couple weeks now? I think I'm over my jet lag, so I'm thankful that I'm adjusted into American life. Uh, one of the most incredible things that I got to be a part of with Pastor Joel was to dedicate precious babies to the Lord. Now, here's the thing. These uh, babies or these girls who had these babies, these girls are victims. These babies are born out of someone's sexualized deviation. And for to 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 see these girls and and say I want to I want to dedicate my baby to to the Lord. Do we have the video? This was just a little glimpse. Sound. We pray peace upon them. 
praying peace and protection. Now, here, Living Water Church, I didn't even ask for your permission, but because we dedicated under the umbrella of this faith community, Living Water Church, we are committing to staying in prayer for these babies. And so will you just uh, join me in that as we continue to move forward for such a time as this? We here at Living Water Church are committed to the safety and protection against a sexualized culture. The second point I want to leave with you today is this. The devil is a deceiver. The devil is a deceiver. I have to imagine Paul's wave of emotions as he's writing to the church. He's frustrated, he's sad, he's mad, he's genuinely caring, he's honest, he's concerned, he's as truthful as possible, and I'm sure, I am sure, I am positive, so much more emotions. And verse 5 gives us some insight of what Paul was trying to communicate and because in, within the context of biblical marriage, verse 5, do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together, come back together in sex, so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Don't allow the devil to move from a foothold to a stronghold in your marriage, Paul is suggesting. So maybe it might be best to pray together instead of having sex, but come together, come back together, so that Satan will not trap you. And this is important to reiterate and reinforce. Satan does not create sexual desire. Did you hear me? Satan does not create sexual desire. God created sexual desire. It is not sinful or satanic to feel sexual desire. Satan does not create sexual desire. Listen, he uses it. More, more accurately, he abuses it. And the devil is a deceiver. He was then and he is now. Think about how difficult. Just, just get in the shoes of a Christian family in the culture and life of Corinth. Just, just do this. Think about this, how difficult it must have been for a Christian family having to withstand porneia the minute they left their homes and into public life. Uh, it was more than just images, it, it, it was, there were all kinds of sexual acts happening right in front of them. So think about how difficult that might have been. It was as if you were pray, P-R-E-Y, for the enemy to convince you, to confuse you, to control you, especially sexually. And the truth is, in today's society, listen, you don't even have to step outside your front door to be sexually confronted. It's in the confines of inside the home, at your fingertips. Pornea. The devil is a deceiver. I want to just uh, take this time. Give me about three to five minutes. Okay? Can you give me three to five minutes? I have one more point. But I want to just take this time to pray specifically for our kids, our young adults, and yes, even adults today. Our country, our world. So pray with me. Father, as we sang earlier, facilitated by Bella, Break what breaks your heart. Break what breaks your heart. 
Father, in our own strength, we know that we can't stop what seemingly is the inevitable. Lord, protect us from a world that would say, stop telling lies when you tell the truth. God, protect us. We ask your Holy Spirit to give us boldness in this hour, even this minute, to take a stand in Jesus' name. Help us to be compassionate to a world that has no biblical standard. So, Lord, just as you went to the center of the sinners with the love that you not only demonstrated on the cross, but you exemplified and embodied face-to-face, in person, in conversation. Help us to do the same. I pray right now, especially for young families who have young kids in this house. God, we need you. Would you bring protection? Would you, just as the uh, Israelites put blood on the top of their doors to let death pass over. Father, would you, through your blood and through your sacrifice on the cross, would you literally let death pass over these homes, pass over these moms and dads, pass over these kids from the enemy's lies of stealing and killing and destroying. Father, we need you. We so need you. We pray for our country, that our country would come back to Jesus. Start with us, we pray. We pray for uh, this world. Send missionaries from America again. For the sake of the gospel and for the sake of life and life eternal, in Jesus' name, amen. The last point is this, the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter of all that we are talking about today is found in the previous chapter. We touched on this last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. It is not YOLO. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your, with your body. I want to remind us that Paul is providing his opinion and suggestions. And because Paul is single, his advice was like him to stay single at every cost because you'll be pure and safer from the sexual pressures that come when you're married. And Paul says, but if being single is causing you to sin, then get married so your sexual desires given by God can be fulfilled in the safety and confines of biblical marriage. Now, that doesn't mean, because we like to use this verse, and I do a lot of marriage, pre-marriage counseling, and, and we just kind of like flippantly say, like, if you're burning with, you know, sexual desire, you probably should like change the date of your wedding. Because you're, because you don't want to find yourself in that situation. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, trivialize this. But there's so much more to why Paul is saying this. It was a protection. It was a guard to the sexual immorality that was happening. And some of the demonic philosophies that even the church was inviting in. Again, we have to keep in mind the highly sexual, sexualized culture of Corinthian life. It was as if you were a target for sexual immorality if you were married God's way, which was a goal of the enemy then and a goal of the enemy today. And to the believer who's uh, married to an unbeliever, Paul's attitude, his suggestion, his take, his uh, concern, his, his uh, encouragement is to hang in there. Your, your unbelieving spouse and even your unbelieving children, this may be the only Jesus that, you get, that they get and the only light that they're exposed to in Jesus' name. Now, again, this verse for so long has been like, see, God allows missionary dating. I can date 
to hopefully somebody will get saved or my, my girlfriend or boyfriend will get saved, so I'll, I'll do missionary dating. <laughs> Are you with me? Integrity of Scripture is so crucial. Today is an invitation to give your body, your mind, your heart, and your soul to the living God. The character of your heart, the purity of your mind, and integrity of your soul is reserved for God and God alone. The bottom line is if you're married or single, your body belongs to the Lord. That is, if you give and grant him your everything. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. But unlike uh, other religions of the day, uh, we'll call it imposition, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll commit your allegiance to, to this religion or you'll die. You've got no choice. I'm so grateful that the gospel is propositional. Will you give your heart to Jesus? He is such a gentleman. And despite what the world says, I don't want to believe in a God that forces me to do anything. God doesn't force you to do anything. But when you give your everything to him, watch out. Your life gets changed for the sake of his glory and for the sake of his praise. Your life is never the same. Your family is never the same. Your home is never the same. Your marriage is never the same. Your workplace is never the same. Your neighborhood is never the same. Your church is never the same. When collectively, as a one heart and one mind, we say, Jesus, here's my everything. And so that's the invitation today. YOLO, the combat to that is we stand against a sexualized culture. The devil is a deceiver. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The heart of the matter, give Jesus your heart. Give him your life. And Paul's advice in chapter 7 ultimately is an uh, admonishment to embody love God's way. And Paul was uh, writing the letter uh, to the church in Rome uh, kind of at the same time while addressing the Corinthian church. And he says here, kind of I think sets the precedence for uh, the heart of the matter, true love embodied in Jesus' name in Romans 12, 9 to 10. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Let's stand and pray. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how God used this particular message to challenge you or to encourage you or to lift you up or not keep you in a state of being torn down. I don't, I don't know, and, and I don't even want to even guess. All I know is that we can trust God and his word. And... Uh, I'm thankful that we don't have to embellish the truth. The truth does, in fact, speak for itself. Uh, so, church, we're living in a, in a day that we're not defeated. We're, we're living in a day that, yes, is very challenging, full of storms. But we're not broken. This is not the end of the story. And so for such a time as this, I, if there's, if there's uh, something that's moving in your heart, I don't know, even if it's uh, something challenging, just as we kind of do the music together, just go see somebody that, that uh, is standing in the back that wants to pray. If God is even moving you in your seat to pray for, some, for, for someone else, go for it. But I think that um, God is... is, is uh, wanting to do business and heart surgery in each of our hearts. So allow him to do that. 
And Father, I thank you for your word again. I thank you that we're living in this day. Because we know that as the dark gets darker, we know, Father, in your grace and mercy, you are pushing out the light to get brighter. And Father, help us to step in and say yes. Help us to no longer be naive. Help us to get out from under the sand because we're fearful. We don't like what's happening, and so if I just don't see it, if I just don't hear it, then it certainly is not there. God, help us, awaken us to see the truth of, in fact, what is happening today. But thank you, God, that you don't leave us there. We do have the power through your spirit to walk through these days. So we pray as a church that you would help us to be the light of Jesus in this town, extended out of this town or the places that uh, are represented around, in Galt, in the Sacramento region, in Elk Grove. So our hearts are yours. In Jesus' name.